and also getting out the vote with a particular focus on down the ballot candidates and initiatives. And so mainly right now, that's what we're doing. We are full um, federal campaigns. We do canvassing, phone banking, um, go to events, um, speaking, you know, we do speaking engagements. The run amok of that comes with uh, all different type of campaign activities. And cho the choice here when in I Am Choice has to do with women's reproductive choices? Um, yeah, the, the choice in I Am Choice actually is more about choice in a liberty sense, right? So we're, we use it in a variety of ways. Um, with Amendment 6, we use it as far as being pro-choice, but we also do I Am Choice, I Choose to Vote. Um, you know, if we're going to do an educational initiative, we'll do I Am Choose, I Am Choice, I Choose Quality Education. So we interpret cho choice to support whatever it is we're, we're doing at the time. All right, let's get to Amendment 6 then. There is a group that you're part of that's, that's the No on 6 Coalition. What is Amendment 6 and why are you opposed to it? Okay, um, there are a couple different groups that are actually fighting against Amendment 6 and I will just clarify so that there's not a lot of um, confusion. There's NIC 6, which is led by the TBAC group of NOW. There's a No on 6 Coalition, which is a bunch of groups organized and funded by the Planned Parenthood PAC. And then there is our group, which is I Am Choice. Um, and essentially, we are all fighting against Amendment 6 mainly because Amendment 6 is, is just an anti-choice measure. Um, specifically, it's called the Prohibition of, um, on Public Funding of Abortions and Construction of Abortion Rights, but it definitely doesn't construct any abortion rights. Rather, it um, eats away at women's privacy rights. And it's gonna create, it's gonna carve out an exception in the Florida Constitution that only applies to women in the Privacy Clause, so when it comes to reproductive choice, um, basically, so that no longer applies to reproductive choice. And so the privacy, I think, for us is the number one issue um, and what that can lead to. In the court system, that would lead to more anti-choice uh, laws being found constitutionally sound. So you have laws like the ultrasound, which didn't pass, the mandatory ultrasound, which didn't pass because it was found um, unconstitutional with the privacy clause, would now be able to pass if you had something like Amendment 6. Um, in addition to that, it, it uh, would ban abortions completely from public employees private health insurance plans and we see that as highly problematic that's one step to leading towards an um, all-encompassing no exception ban um, statewide and ultimately what uh, the regressors are trying to do federally and so let's get back to this privacy component in the florida constitution when roe versus wade was decided at the u.s level the implicit privacy in that's afforded to people in the US Constitution is one of the reasons that Roe versus Wade was uh, was um, decided that way and Florida has an I think if I'm not mistaken one of the strongest privacy uh, components in their Constitution in our Constitution than any other state and so this amendment amendment 6 would chip away at that is that what you're saying yeah essentially I mean exactly the language is is every natural person has the right to be let alone and free from government intrusion into the person's private life and so when the amendment says we're going to reduce uh, this for women from the, this current language to the U.S. Constitution, it's actually saying it's going to reduce it to nothing because there is actually nothing in the U.S. Constitution that gives us privacy protections. So yes, Florida has the most stringent privacy protections. We see it problematic that men would be able to retain their full privacy rights and women's would be able to chip away. Another aspect to point out with this is that in the amendment, the language broadly interpreted is included. And so we know that once the amendment passed, it would be the legislator that would be broadly interpreting how it would be applied. All right, well, we're going to talk a little bit about the rally in just a minute, but I do want to go to the phones. Right now we have Robert in Safety Harbor. Hi, Robert. What would you like to say? Um, you know, why don't you, why don't you uh, talk about the debate and we'll see where it goes. I, I, you know, I did have this topic in mind and of course my guest is with this topic, but yeah, if you want to talk about the de debate, let's see where that goes.
do you why don't you can you talk about the debate at all like the the binders full of women did you hear that so so why don't you answer it his questions with respect to you know your group and how what your group thinks about those the, what he said what Romney said okay. is that right? Yeah, so he's making comments. I just comment on his comments, right? Yeah. All right, thank you, Robert. Thank you for that call, and thank you for those observations. Um, m some of that was a little bit off topic, but very topical. Um, uh, thank you for the thoughts about the debate, and I'm sure we'll be talking about the debate a lot in the next few days. Um, just, uh, yeah, my topic today is about the women's issue, so we'll get to what you were talking about, the, the binders full of women issue, uh, statement in just a second. I also should say that a lot of the things that you brought up have been talked about on Democracy Now!, and if, if anyone out there missed the second hour of Democracy Now! today, because we were able to play the first hour, but they had a two-hour discussion with the three candidate, three of the candidates that were excluded from the debate, uh, you can go back and listen on their website at democracynow.org. But let me ask Ayeli, our guest, about the binders full of women um, topic that, that Romney brought up yesterday, and also just in general about the women's issues that were brought up in the debate. What do you think about that? Well, I definitely think the binders full of women was an offensive comment. Um, I think anytime you can start counting um, the minority groups you are uh, in touch with, it's problematic because for me, you, you just, in an inclusive world, just have people and you wouldn't be keeping count. But um, essentially, I would say that uh, I definitely feel that Romney Ryan ticket would be a threat to women's rights um, on various accounts from choice to uh, you know, defining the legitimacy of rape, to domestic abuse, and um, other, uh, I guess other rights that women have fought to work to earn, as well as other areas where don't seem to be important. Um, Jobs-wise, women hold the majority of minimum wage jobs in this country. So that's another concern that I don't think a Robin Ryan ticket would tackle. I would like to point out, although Rob Romney has moved to be more moderate when it comes to women's issues and say, for instance, he would maintain exceptions with the uh, Constitution, when Ryan is asked, he always says, a Romney ticket. Um, under a Romney ticket, this is what we would do, which clearly says to me that Paul Ryan does still believe in a uh, total ban of abortion with no exceptions. Um, I do think we all got upset about the Todd Aiken forced rape comment, but uh, when it comes to it, Ryan co-sponsored over 20 of... Uh, Todd Aikens, or at least participating, um, signed on to over 20 of Todd Aikens' legislation um, geared towards reducing our rights for women while he was in Congress. And so I think we all have to remember, you know, if Mitt Romney was to win, uh, and God forbid something happened to him, Paul Ryan would be president. 
I don't think it's good enough to look at how Romney feels about prejudiced uh, women. I think we need to look at how Ryan feels as well. And um, I think we would find someone who is not only, I think you could use the term a bigoted, a bigot when it comes to women and his thoughts, but is looking at a total regression. All right, well, let's go back to the phone. We have on the line Becky Rubright, and she is actually organizing in, in uh, opposition to Amendment 6 protest as we speak. Becky, are you on the line? I am. All right, well, tell us where you are and uh, what your action is. So what does it look like right now? Is there any confrontation, or do you have other people joining you? Um, yeah, there's about uh, 10 to 15 of us out here. I actually walked a little bit off the road just to uh, escape from the noise. Um, and there's a lot of people that are just trying to get out of here. All right, Becky Rubright is there at 110, I think she said, Northdale Maple. 110, uh, 1010, yeah. Northdale Mabry is just north of Linebaugh at the, uh, at the doctor's offices of Randy Armstrong, who is a proponent of Yes on Six, and she's organizing a rally there to oppose Amendment Six, which is one of the topics we're talking about on the show today. So, so Becky, thanks for calling in. Thank you so much, and thanks for everything. Thank you, Becky. All right, thanks. We're going to move on to our next call. Unless, uh, do you want to respond to that? Um, just to respond to what um, Becky was saying about the taxpayers and parental rights, um, there are, uh, in the, currently in the state of Florida, we abide by the Hyde Amendment, which does not allow us to use public funding for abortion, um, only exceptions of Kate, um, rape, incest, and um, life-threatening illness. And we've been doing that, uh, you know, for over three decades now. So it's redundant to say that we want taxpayer funds to pay for abortion, because they already don't. And as far as parental rights, there's nothing in this amendment that will lead to parental rights. Um, if this amendment was to pass, the next day parents, parents still would not have consent rights. They have promised it as if you vote yes on this, it will one day possibly maybe lead to parental um, consent. But, yes. All right, we can move on to our next caller. Andrew in Bartow, welcome to the show. Yes, um, and, and not specifically Roman Ryan and Ticket. I mean, with Amendment 6, that is the war on women happening right here in Florida. And what we are definitely concerned about is access, which is what pro-choice is. Pro-choice essentially says that we believe all women should have access to have safe abortions, which is a medical procedure in a safe medical facility. So yes, we're not arguing the public funding thing. That's already established as federal law. We're focused more on the threats to privacy that this amendment, um, that in, that's involved in this amendment. I do that so that I do that so that the mic on my camera can pick up. Can you turn up the monitor? I do have a problem with public funding of it, and I think that's where a lot of confusion 
uh, comes up. I, you know, from what I, the people I know opposed to it, and those, uh, it's not the the choice issue. It's just that. Do you want to respond to him, or should we just move on? Pay yeah, with their tax um, but more importantly, what I was really following is, as I just showed, I don't know much about Amendment Six at all. I'm so wondering if you could kind of detail it a little bit so that I will know when it's on the issue what I'm voting for. Can you read the text of it? It's crazy language. Yeah, um, but yeah, just to give you a quick summation of Amendment 6, Amendment 6 basically is, is what I said before. It, it does attach a stipulation that says that uh, we wouldn't use public funding to pay for abortion. We already currently don't do that because it, uh, we follow the Hyde Amendment. And the second provision is the provision that would threaten and uh, <coughs> essentially take away women's privacy rights. So those are the two aspects that really compose Amendment 6. It's called prohibition on public funding, but again, it's redundant. We already don't use public funding uh, to pay for abortions. It's not something any group against Amendment 6 is advocating for. What we are advocating is that women should keep the same privacy rights that men would have. And essentially, it is not for politicians to interfere in women's um, health care and to make the decisions that women should be making between themselves and their doctors. All right, thank you so much for that call, Andrew. And Lee, you're on the phone. What would you like to say? Regarding that exception to the Hyde Amendment that uh, there can be abortion in cases of incest or rape, there's a study online uh, that clearly uh, has points out that even that is very, very difficult to obtain and often denied when the abortion should be allowed. So uh, that is, to think that everyone with uh, uh, who have had been uh, raped or uh, raped by incest can get an abortion, that's false. It's, even though it's on paper, it's not actually carried out because the agencies are so afraid of violating that prohibition on using federal funds. And the other, uh, first of all, I really want to thank all the, the women who are uh, out there fighting this. I can't thank you enough. And my second point is about uh, teenagers and, and uh, minors. Uh, they, they need to be able to get an abortion without parental consent for uh, several reasons. They're, they are often too ashamed or yes, afraid okay. of their parents mm -hmm. to tell them. And uh, teenagers have died. Girls have died. There was a Becky Bell died 16 from a back alley abortion when abortion was legal. But um, because she couldn't tell her parents she had a back alley abortion, then her mother found out when her daughter was dying in a hospital bed. So... Um, it's keeping that